Hi everyone, I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, this is actually a roundup of the discussion forum for week three, and I will go through week four um, in the next day. So um, I just wanted to respond because there was so much through. A fruitful dialogue that happened and discussion and so I just wanted to provide a little bit of a response to that. Um, so especially around climate action responses there's really thoughtful dialogue and for me this has been a tension that I've been struggling with in terms of um, how individual actions or policies are measured often just based on greenhouse gas emissions and how we should think about um, how these reductions should be put forward considering that they need to occur within the social and cultural realities of people's lives. And so when we have um, strategies or policies put forward, um, what is the mechanism that can best address that, those and, you know, do we think of them as a blanket? I mean, even if we think about Canada, if our federal government were to put them forward, um, the lived reality of different ge geographic places totally shift how, what's possible for some people. And, and, you know, even if you think about active transportation, you know, if you live in a place where there is, um, in, in southern Canada, where there is a high population, there's more, there's better uh, public transportation, so that's a service that you can, you can use. Um, where you're walking to and from, maybe a smaller distance, where if you're living in a northern community, um, maybe you're having to drive further distances, uh, maybe you live farther away from the town, maybe there is no reliable uh, public transportation, and so in many ways, you can have these sort of like overarching, okay, these are what, where we can see uh, there's big impact for reduction in individual actions. However, it always needs to be contextualized within the lived reality of the place. And so for me, this is a constant tension and I'm constantly dealing with this when I do workshops with teachers on the big thing is always, what do I do? What do I do? What are the top 10 things I can do? And really, I haven't seen a resource that really articulates that clearly for um, concerned people, whether you're a teacher or whether you're a concerned citizen in Canada, we have this the drawdown, and, and Marty pointed it out, is global, right? And really, when you're looking at drawdown, it's not just individual actions. These are actions for policymakers, for um, international government, or for governments to talk about on an international level. Um, some of them can be also facilitated at a municipal level, um, and some are individual, but they are not all individual actions. It's That document is not meant to be just individual actions. Um, from that perspective. Um, and one of the things, thinking about this sort of, um, in terms of actions and how we can think about them, um, I just wanted to read a quick um, piece because one of the things that I think is really important is as we see the public and as we see this groundswell towards understanding the severity of our situation. And as we see more and more movement happen, there are things we need to be very mindful of. So I'm just gonna read a quick section from this book, which is called The Great Disruption by Paul Gilding. And the subtitle is, Why the Climate Crisis Will Bring on the End of Shopping and the Birth of a New World. And um, we don't have any readings from this book, but this book um, is quite a hopeful, uh, but realistic picture of what the transition into a new future could be and what that might mean. <clears throat> so for me, this has been uh, a hopeful read, uh, but also it doesn't blue sky the situation. It looks at several decades of hard sacrifice and the requirements of understanding um, I'll read the, t the quote and then you can, you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, so this is Paul Gilding's word, words. When the Great Awakening occurs, the response of society is quite predictable based on previous major national and global crises. 
We consistently respond in the same way. It will be dramatic, high profile, and expensive. It will engage most or all sectors of society. It will be framed by a shift into a whatever it takes approach to solving the problem at hand, and it will involve strong direct intervention by government. Even though it is hard to imagine today, the global community will at this point rapidly, though messily, develop a global emergency response to cut climate pollution and pursue a safe climate, whatever the cost. So whatever the cost. The transformation around sustainability will then follow rapidly. The response will be framed by a single critical idea. To quote my favorite climate strategist, he's being cheeky here, Winston Churchill, um, and if you're not familiar with Winston Churchill, he was the uh, uh, Prime Minister of the UK who really sort of brought together global powers to address the rise of uh, the Nazis in uh, World War II. So this is Winston Churchill. It is no use saying we are doing our best. We have got to succeed in doing what is necessary. In the context of Churchill's comment, what will be necessary is an emergency response that will involve an extraordinary level of global cooperation and unity of purpose, well beyond anything we've ever seen and for which the only comparable, though still inadequate, example is the mobilization of most parts of the world during World War II. It will require a clear goal, a picture of the enemy, rapid change, considerable dislocation, and widespread sacrifice. So this is interesting in terms of providing that context. And one of the things that it raises for me and that I've, I've been slowly becoming more aware of is the rise of what we call eco-fascism. And so um, many of you follow the news, um, the massacre that happened at the mosque in New Zealand, um, the young man who was the shooter was a self-avowed eco-fascist. And eco-fascists generally are against multiculturalism. They believe that people should be should go back to their origin country. And part of what they are doing is through acts of hate, um, talk they are trying to limit population control, but also are targeting and killing minority groups. Um, so you can go and look on the eco-fascists, like if you go into Twitter and look up eco-fascism or there's all kinds of um, conversations that are that are happening around this and they are like alt-right groups or individuals who are talking about how their countries should be white supremacist countries. And so this notion of as we see the need to respond to climate change and as the as climate change becomes the face of the enemy and we need to uh, uh, combat it, the concern is how do we maintain equity and fairness in terms of our global responses? And I think eco-fascism and the rise of eco-fascism that, that you can see online is something that we need to be very, very critical of and name as racist and inappropriate. Um, and you can see this also around immigration policies. So looking at, um, if you look on social media around responses to building the wall, again, you can see this eco-fascist rhetoric rising where as alt-right groups understand that immigration, that climate change is gonna be creating millions, if not billions of immigrants, then as the acceptance that climate change is happening, then you see this eco-fascist rhetoric unfold. And so, this tension, as we move towards greater understanding of the severity of what climate change means, and as the impacts um, occur, we're going to see these tensions unfold. And that's why finding ways for what Paul Gilding talks about, the Great Awakening, but to address our systemic shifts with this understanding of fairness and equity and not allowing for racist policies to unfold is really, really critical. And one which you don't see necessarily in mainstream media and so often, right? We, um, I think Courtney raised this, that we talk about actions um, really and climate change impacts. And then we talk about solutions really in terms of green tech and energy. And we really need to be very mindful of all of the ways that climate change impacts will impact 
our quality of life and also how our solutions are embedded within uh, social and cultural practices which understand fairness and equity. Um, so I just really wanted to highlight that. Um, second, the activism section, wonderful conversations and really this piece around individual act activism and collective action and um, the coming to understanding as well that our many of our systems, are, are, especially our economic system, has led us to being very individually minded as well as the ways that our communities have become more individually focused and we've moved away from larger social groupings whether that's intergenerational or the bonds that we use to delineate community, the social cohesion has also been eroded. And so looking at that, um, whether, you, and I use activism and sometimes collective action interchangeably. Um, and one of the things that I've really come to realize is that the more people learn about climate change, and Greta Thunberg makes this call that we're at a time that Anyone with any understanding of the climate crisis needs to find a way to speak about that. And invariably, once you start to speak publicly about this, because it is a politicized issue, it becomes a political issue. And I really appreciated reading Courtney's post about feeling somewhat fatigued and um, not ready to be necessarily front and center in terms of the public and addressing some of the backlash that one receives when you do this. So. That's where we have to also take care of each other and also build collective support systems so that we have communities of practice where we are, where we are feeling supported. Um, and this is unfolding all over the place. So for me locally, I've been in many, many talks this week, which is why I'm so late um, responding. I gave a talk to 200 seniors on Wednesday morning. I held a discussion at the university with our local, with our federal MP and a lead climate change speaker to have the public be able to ask questions and hear comments from our conservative MP's response. Then we launched um, Friday night and then all day Saturday was a day and a half long community action. Um, planning, which was both educational, bringing together people from nine different sectors from our community to have conversations in their sectors about what are, how are they going to respond to the climate crisis. And this was a huge, wonderful event, but there's also a lot of feelings, a lot of ideas how we do this. And this work, um, you know, I'm quite flat right now because of the amount of being public in the last week. And I think we also need to be really honest about the toll that this work can take on us and the moral obligation it is to speak publicly, but also how we have to take care of ourselves. So, and it's a constant give and take. And I know many of you are very active in your communities and you see this. Um, also, I noticed um, Kay shared the Bill Nye video, which many of you saw circulating. I played this to a group of seniors. Uh, that I gave the talk to on Wednesday morning and I had a standing ovation after the video and I wasn't done my talk. So I think it does really respond as well with that senior uh, demographic. And in the talk that I gave to these seniors, I really called upon them to ask what is their legacy. They've grown up as a generation that's had immense privilege and culture in terms of jobs, prosperity, um, environmental stability, and I asked them what their legacy was. And I also said, you know, you're the generation who changed the social politics of the world. And more than any other time, we need intergenerational activists to show us how to do that collective organizing. And I, I outlined several events that they could come to. And the one that they chose to come to was a climate strike that we had here in Aurelia on Friday that was led by... Um, a group of high schools, high school students. And the interesting thing was there was only about four high school students and then there was a handful of kids and then there was about 60 seniors who actually took over the march. We, we usually walk the block and they, they took over the march and they went right to our um, MP, MPP's office and decided they would protest there. And uh, so very interesting to see how all of this is playing out. Um, and the other piece that came out 
um, after Friday is that the uh, Greta Thunberg has asked for the September 20th day of climate action and had, they are now inviting adults to attend. And at the, um, on the weekend for our education sector, which we had school board people, teachers, some people from the university, as well as interested citizens, and unanimously, they voted to have the September 20th Day of Climate Action as the number one initiative that they wanted to support. And they want it to be not just student-led, but the whole community to support. And our mayor is now planning to attend. And we had six out of nine councillors hear this and show support. So very interesting in terms of how we see these dynamics working and how the, the student-led global um, uh, strike movement is is shifting. The other piece that I think is really interesting, and I think it was Shannon, but I could be wrong, who brought this up, is the way that Extinction Rebellion, who are an activist group, have really changed the dialogue around climate change. And because they use the word extinction, and we're starting to see this word be used a lot more by actually quite conservative thinkers, but Extinction Rebellion has been the group that has put this into the media's attention. And they have brought in, they've changed, between Greta Thunberg and uh, Extinction Rebellion, they've changed the way that media is starting to report around climate change. And because of the uprising that they did in April, they also, um, that also led to Jeremy Corbyn uh, Labor Party presenting the motion to, I, sorry, my daughter's yelling for me one second, um, to put the motion to declare the entire UK in a state of climate emergency, which is the first nation to do that. And Jeremy Corbyn, after doing this, said that it was because of hearing students say, our children, our planet, as well as the effects that uh, Extinction Rebellion's protests had on the city of London. So it's very interesting in terms of the way that this is all unfolding and how in Canada we're not seeing it, but in Europe the you can see the impact of protests as happening on policy and on the way media is covered, covering it. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say, um, but overall, uh, apologies for being somewhat absent over the last week in the course, um, it, and I have, I'm going to catch up this week and get some marks to you as well as, um, give you an update for week four, and we're now into week five, so at this point as well. If you have questions about your personal choice assignment, that things aren't unfolding as you hoped, um, or your communication, then get in touch and let's come up with a plan to make sure that you can finish strong. And um, yeah, keep up your excellent, excellent work. And I can tell many of you are really um, working through some of these big topics, uh, both personally and intellectually, and that's the best that we can, we can hope for in a course. So thank you for um, spending the time talking with each other, keeping this thoughtful discussion going amongst yourselves. And I know not having a face-to-face um, -face can really sort of diminish our ability to engage in these meaningful conversations. And I'd like to um, just recognize that you're doing it very well in the discussion forum. So thank you for your time and your energy. And let's keep doing what we do. Okay, take care. Bye.